each fighter pilot's life, there are many, many incidents where they have had close shave in life. I have had about 10 of them. It was planned that I will fly, so I flew and we took off. Uh, five minutes after takeoff, when we are at an altitude of 11,000 feet, there is a single engine in Mirage 2000. Some big loud sound came and we found that the engine has ceased and we lost the engine. And now when you lose the single engine, you have no other choice but to get out of the aircraft. And the aircraft you get out through an ejection seat. So at 28 times G, uh, you, uh, your blood from your head goes down, you are blacked out and uh, you see stars literally in your brain. And but within two, eight, two and a half seconds, the parachute opens. Air Marshal Anil Chopra passed out from National Defense Academy and was commissioned as a fighter pilot in the Indian Air Force in 1973. In this podcast, we dive into some deep discussions about life, compassion, spirituality, and Air Marshal Chopra's near-death experience. This episode is for everyone who wants to rise up the ladder in their respective leadership positions and use their passion for the greater good of humanity. Get ready for this exciting episode and please remember to subscribe, like and share this video. Hello, Air Marshal Anand Chopra. Thank you so much for being on Under the Tree. It's a pleasure, it's an honor having you here today. Thank you, Amira. It's a pleasure for me to be giving a, uh, doing an interaction with a lovely lady. And uh, I, I presume that we are going to have some good fun uh, talking to the youth of the country. Yes. Of course, you served our country for so long. So this conversation will definitely enlighten and motivate and inspire our youth to follow on your footsteps. So I would like to not waste any time and just go straight to it. Um, you know, you are a proud citizen who have served the country and you have an immense amount of courage, the things that you did for India. Um, you know, what urged you to take this step into becoming a fighter pilot? What was your first motivation or, uh, you know, was there some incident that inspired you? How did this first come about? Yeah, Amira, first let me tell you that I'm uh, extremely proud to have been a fighter pilot, to have been in the Indian Air Force, to have, uh, uh, to be a very patriotic person and for, uh, in my own little way, contributed to this uh, country and I continue to do that even today. Uh, yes, I am Amira from a small town, Kapurthala in Punjab. Uh, my father was a middle class uh, person, he used to run a small factory, but basically he was a sports person. He was a sports person, in fact he became the captain of the Indian basketball team in the first Asian Games. Uh, but uh, he was not a great businessman, so he was not making money. So when I was very small, uh, I was in a small local school, but a signing school came up in Kapurthala. Now my father thought, uh, and the other people in the town thought that it is a great idea to send our children to a signing school because the quality of education that you were going to get over there was going to be phenomenal. So with this background, uh, my father and all his friends sent their children uh, into uh, the signing school. There was a big uh, selection process uh, to get into the signing school. And uh, I joined um, signing school. And what happens in signing school? It was January uh, 1962. And in the school, they made you wear uniforms. I was uh, just, uh, I was in class five. I was nine years old. And I was in a uniform and I was having uniform people around me, the principal, the headmaster, everybody was in uniform. And that is how uh, my first contact with military came. And that is how I, later on, uh, you know, I decided to join the armed forces. Yes. And, um, you know, what type of values or what type of traits do you need to pursue, um, you know, not just a career of fighter pilot, but for any career that requires some form of courage or fashion. So what are some of the values that you need for that? Yeah, Amira, let me first tell you how uh, when I had joined the school, it was meant for good education. How did I decide that I must get into uh, the military? You know, uh, seeing these very disciplined, courageous people who are in uniform around us, 
uh, and the, uh, uh, the discipline that they were, the, 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 how smart they used to look in uniform, how smartly they used to walk. I got a feeling that this is where I need to be. So my first instinct was that I want to join the military. In fact, to be specific, army. And then 1965 war took place. And when that war happened, I see a lot of fighter planes used to fly over uh, Kaputla and I saw some dog fights. And that's the time I changed my mind. Uh, instead of just being in the military, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And to be a military officer, uh, the route is through National Defense Academy. And so I applied, very tough competition. There were uh, nearly 3 lakh people who had applied and only 200 of us, uh, 250 of us were to be selected. And that is uh, where the actual value system starts getting built when you're an NDA. You know, NDA's motto is service before self. Mm -hmm. And two things, courage and integrity. These are the two great values that NDA teaches you over and above service before self. You know, I personally feel that courage is a core value. If you have courage from that flow, many, many other things. And when it comes to integrity, integrity to yourself first, to everybody around you next, and to the nation. So uh, these two core values, in addition to in India, they hammer you. It's like in a blacksmithy shop. Uh, they, you know, it's like a hot iron on which they are hammering you and giving you a shape. So NDA, uh, you know, toughens you, makes a man out of the boy. And uh, NDA is a place where the values that we learned in NDA till today, all our course mates, our friends, we value and, uh, you know, they inspire us even today. Yes. And um, I know you're talking a lot about courage, but the problem with our youth today is that they often think courage is like, oh, I'm going to just drive, you know, a motorcycle at the highest speed or I'm going to just get drunk and have this much alcohol. They think courage is more of like a risk taking thing to show off to people. But when you talk about courage, it's more on like selfless service courage. So can you just distinguish those things? Yeah. Yeah. See, Amira, uh, you know, uh, driving fast when you're young. I mean, when I, I uh, was young, my first uh, vehicle I bought was a bullet, bullet motorcycle. And I used to drive very fast, uh, not recklessly fast. I, I didn't take drugs. I didn't take alcohol, but I used to enjoy the speed. So, uh, you know, this aspect of youth is quite all right. You know, you drive. It's not to take risk because it's a thrill that you get. It's like a fighter pilot. You know, you, you, you speed is something you, you, you enjoy. The car racing driver, you know, reckless. speed is, but no recklessness. See, so there is the difference between, and these, some of the other traits, like in our case, I joined NDA at the age of 15. You know, uh, there was no college, there was no co-ed education that I went through, straight into uh, the National Defense Academy. So the value system that you pick up at such a young age, um, uh, many of the children who uh, pick up some of these uh, other uh, not so correct habits like drugs, etc., they're the ones who pick, pick up at the age of around college going time. So, so that's the time. So there is uh, courage to, to have drugs is not courage. Surely not. Uh, and uh, even to drive fast is not courage. That's excitement. So courage is uh, something different. Courage is uh, to be able to do things which uh, you have conviction with because uh, you, you, you feel that they are the correct things to do. So there is a big uh, difference between uh, courage and, uh, you know, uh, do, doing something which is unauthorized. Yeah. You know, just before this conversation, we were talking about unconditional love. And that's one of your favorite words. So what do you, I guess, mean by that? Because, you know, we often, a lot of people have a different definition of what that is. But, you know, for you who's serving the country for so long, you couldn't have done it without unconditional love. So Yeah, yeah. you know, let me amplify this unconditional love a little more. You know, there are two words in my life, which I have followed and I advocate to everybody I meet in life. Passion and enthusiasm. You know, I like, I watched that movie, Three Idiots, which many of you must have watched. You know, in Three Idiots, the core issue that came out is that you must join a profession that you love or love the profession you are in. So my contention is 
we come in this world once. You come into this world once. In that time, a bulk of the day that you spend, you spend at work. And therefore, you must do that kind of a work which you love. So, passion and enthusiasm means you must have passion for the work that you are doing and you must do it enthusiastically. So, you know, I love painting, but uh, I may just be sitting in front of a painting and doing nothing. I have a passion, but enthusiasm. So, passion and enthusiasm are two very, very important things and love superimposes both these words because uh, where there is love to a human being, love to a job, love to environment, love to anything unconditionally. Either you are in it or you are not in it. There is no mid path when it comes to passion and enthusiasm. Yes. Um, and you know, being a fighter pilot, I guess your main, as you said, we spend so much time and work on a daily basis. So your place of work is technically the sky. And, you know, I've been thinking about this for such a long time. Like when I go out in the nature and I look up, I wonder like just about our existence and what's up there. So I was wondering, do you have those thoughts or have you ever wondered when you were up there that like, you know, what is this big galaxy and what's here? And if, is there something beyond this? So did you ever have those thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I must, before I uh, come to what you're asking, let me explain what is a fighter pilot all about. You know, uh, a fighter pilot, I became a fighter pilot uh, when I was 20 years and four months mm -hmm. old. That's very young. very young. And, uh, you know, to, do you know how much a fighter aircraft costs today? For example, a Rafale costs 80 million dollars. That's one hell of a lot of money. When I was, when I became a fighter pilot, I was flying a MiG-21. That was a, the aircraft of that time. And at that age, you were firing rockets, bombs, missiles, you know, big responsibility. You know, in a fighter aircraft, there is a single cockpit, single person sits in it. So a big responsibility. When I commanded the Mirage 2000 squadron, I had assets and that was in 1990. I had assets worth 3000 crores under me as a young officer. So this is the what the fighter flying is all about. It's a very, very serious business. The country is, imposes a big responsibility on your shoulders as a pilot, as well as a commanding officer or the flight commander, whatever you do. So that is as far as fighter flying is concerned. It is tough. It is adventurous. It gives you ex ex very exciting, lots of adjectives I can use about fighter flying. But now I come to your question. You asked, what is the feeling? You know, you as I said, you're flying alone. The only contact with the rest of people is the members in your formation would be one or two kilometers away. You can physically see them or with radio contact with the ground station, but you're alone. The whole aircraft responsibility is yours. And when you go higher and higher, then you start seeing the horizon, the curvature of the earth. Higher you go, more lonely you feel. You're alone. So that kind of a feeling comes but uh, you are groomed in the service slowly and steadily, physically and mentally, to be able to uh, uh, withstand that situation. And what do you do? In you don't fly alone. Then we need to train for combat. You fly initially with one versus one, then two versus one, then two versus two, then multiple aeroplanes. Then you do air to air refueling. You have got an a AVAX which is going to support you. So there is a big ecosystem in the sky now uh, from you having taken off alone but you are with large force and that's how you are preparing for you know military engagements and operations yeah so it's it's that's really really great to know and um you know i'm just going to get straight to the your near death experience which i know you've talked a lot about and it's so intriguing because at that point of time that second you know very few are able to make that decision of what they should do and what their next step should be so can you make us go back a little bit to that time like what happened what was your experience and how you had that discretion to know what to do at that time yeah amira let me first tell you that in each fighter pilot's life there are many many incidents where they have had close shave in life i have had about 10 of them. Mm 
And after I retired, I documented each one of them. And it's in public domain so that the other future fighter pilots uh, can learn from what happened to me. But God was kind and I'm sitting with you in the studio today uh, and relating this uh, to you. But yes, the uh, uh, more important event that happened, uh, that happened uh, when I was in the rank of an air marshal. Uh, I was uh, to be exact 59 years, two months old. Uh, it's traditional in the Air Force uh, to when senior officers go for official visits to bases, uh, you go and fly if you're a flyer. So in my case, I went to a Mirage 2000 base. I had commanded the same squadron, the Mirage 2000 squadron, uh, as a younger officer. And uh, with the commanding officer, I said, it was planned that I will fly. So I flew and we took off. Uh, five minutes after takeoff, when we were at an altitude of 11,000 feet, uh, there is a single engine in Mirage 2000. Some big loud sound came and we found that the engine has ceased. Or what you say in simple language, it's broken inside. And we lost the engine. And now when you lose the single engine, you have no other choice but to get out of the aircraft. And the aircraft you get out through an ejection seat. An ejection seat is an automated seat, uh, which uh, once you pull the handle, uh, takes you out, but a lot of events take place between the moment you have pulled the handle to physically parachute opens. There are 19 cartridges stroke rockets that fire within a period of two and a half seconds in a predetermined sequence for everything to happen correctly. Imagine first, you have to be pulled back into the seat so that your body becomes straight. Thereafter, you have to blow the canopy away so that when you go through the canopy, you, you are safe. So there's a sequence of cartridges which are first pulling you back, all happening in decimals of second. And then the seat must go. And seat must go at a, such a speed that the tail of the aeroplane which is coming should not cut you through. So that means the seat must move. So there is a sequence of events that take place and everything is over in two and a half seconds. In that two and a half seconds, your body is having, going through nearly 28 times the force of gravity. Now, force of gravity is what you and I are experiencing sitting here in the studio just now. Yeah. So at 28 times G, uh, you, uh, your blood from your head goes down, you are blacked out, and uh, you're seeing stars literally in your brain. And, but within two, eight, two and a half seconds, the parachute opens. And then you see the beautiful earth down below. And you're floating down. And uh, my case, it happened in the Chambal you know, Valley ravines. And, um, uh, you know, and, and of course, uh, God was kind. And so you thank God, my God, I'm there. I'm all right. So what happened after that? I, came down, we had already told on the radio that there is, uh, you know, we are ejecting. So a helicopter came uh, to pick us up. They found us. We had opened up the parachute because parachute is colored and they could see us from far off. But what I want to tell the youth now is what did I feel that time when I was going up through all this? You know, I was in now the helicopter lying down in a stretcher. They're flying me to the hospital. Uh, that's the standard procedure. And I was thinking, I said, what is it, God forbid, if I had died today, what is it that I wanted to do in life and I had not done it? And two things came in my mind. You know, I always wanted to learn a music, musical instrument. I had not done it. So when I became all right, I mean, after they did the initial medical checkups and sent me to home, I first went to Delhi School of Music to say that I want to learn music. And at the age of 59 years plus, I began to learn saxophone. So why I'm narrating this? And the second thing I wanted is that somebody should bake bread in the house. These are my two desires of life. And then I got a chef and he taught us how to make bread and now we bake bread in the house. So these two desires. The point I'm wanting to make to the youth of this country is, Whatever is your desire, try to fulfill as early as possible. Do it because these are little things which will become your passions in your life. So uh, I'm proud first that I am 
alive. I'm sitting, I'm 70 years old now and uh, I'm sitting straight. Uh, mind you, people who have ejected at the uh, age of 40 and above normally have spine or neck uh, related problems for the rest of their life. But we are all right. So you share so many interesting things on your Twitter and it's always an inspiration. Uh, recently you shared this one quote. Um, it was he would learn to fly one day, must first learn to stand and walk and run and climb and dance. One cannot fly into flying. Um, so I would love if you could explain this quote from your perception, uh, you know, its significance, because I thought it was very, very beautiful. Yeah, you know, before that, uh, I must uh, mention about another tweet, which I did two, three days earlier than this tweet, which is also about fight or fly. You know, there is a difference between a uh, pilot and an uh, aviator. Pilot is a person who flies the aeroplane, but aviator is an artist in the air, who not only flies the aeroplanes, but he also creates pleasure and he makes the aeroplane fly like a dance in there. So now I come to your question, which is about, you know, walking, uh, standing, walking, dancing, and then uh, becoming a waiter. You know, in life, there are very many steps that we must follow. When a kid uh, starts to first time walk, the mother gives her a little gadget, which has got three wheels, uh, and the child stands on it, and then slowly, slowly start, begins to walk. So before you, get to fly, get into the air, it's important to go through some very, very important uh, steps of life. Because the aviator, aviation is a journey. When you reach that point uh, of becoming an aviator, this journey you should have cost through. And everything in it, the standing, the walking, the dancing, are parts of aviation. As I said, you know, the aviator is, is an artist in the air, yeah. That is the context. So there's always like one should take baby steps to accomplish your goals and, Absolutely. and work hard Absolutely. towards, towards Absolutely. it. You, you said it so much better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, sadly, uh, sir, you know, the youth today is getting distracted by a lot of, you know, things that are going on. We were talking about drugs earlier and alcohol and a lot of external peer pressure. Social media is, is one of them that's very harmful in some cases. So what is your advice um, to the youth who, you know, maybe at some point in their time, life might have been passionate about something or had a goal, but they're getting diverted from that. Um, you know, what is a good motivation to bring them back into focus? You know, firstly, I must tell you that uh, most of the youth who go into some of these uh, things like drugs, it's because uh, some peer pressure or some friends of theirs uh, have tried to make it as if this is the done thing. That is how children uh, go through drugs. And of course, drug being intoxicating, uh, it uh, once you take it or once take it two, three times, there is a, I've never taken a drug. So, but uh, I, I can understand that people who take drugs, uh, they, they become habitual because you go into a trance, you get into, uh, you know, some kind of a, a mood, uh, you know, which uh, sort of thing as if you're in a different world. This is the impression one. First thing is, this happens to children who are not made up their mind, who have not got a focus in their life, who's, who all are responsible for this? First, the parents, because you have to create an environment for the child when he's growing up uh, to understand the value systems, to have aims, to have some passions, to have some goals. Teacher, of course, can also do that, but lesser because his job is mainly to teach. But again, value system, the teacher. But a critical thing is the group of friends that you make. So it is very important. There are their friends who have, uh, who have no aims in their life. Uh, but there are others who are focused, who want to make careers, who want to achieve, who want to succeed. So there are this type of group of people in which company you land up is what is the root cause of this. But I must tell the youth, you know, I, I'm looking, uh, you know, absolutely straight to say that drugs is extremely bad. You know, I can say with very, very, uh, you know, great pride. I have three brothers, all of them are grown up like me. 
None of us didn't even smoke, leave it on going for drugs. And I am, I am proud to say that in armed forces, nobody takes drugs. There is no scope for taking drugs. For us, the drug is seva, working for the nation, serving the country. This is our drug. And I wish that more and more youth uh, will uh, take this, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, to serve uh, others, to serve the country. And that is the drug. And I can tell you the excitement, the nasha that you get in doing this is much, much higher. The kind of satisfaction you get than you can, any drug can give you. Yes. Thank you so much for bringing that up because the word that you used of seva, I feel like that's so important for us because what's happening now is that we're just tending to find happiness and these, you know, like shallow things and these temporary pleasures and we're not actually getting that permanent happiness. But like you said, when you do selfless service, when you do seva, you will end up getting that happiness and that unconditional bliss. It's like bound to happen. And I guess in all of our lives, if like even if there's one time we've experienced that, then we should know. And you've done that your entire life. You've served India, you've served the country your entire life. So that's probably why you're in bliss all the time. Um, and talking about India, so like, you know, I was born and brought up in the U.S., Yes. Um, and, you know, there's clear differences between both countries. Um, I mean, even they have an army, they have a, you know, yeah. but, you know, of course, cultural wise, values wise, it's very different. So, you know, how does serving India, the nation of love, spirituality, such strong roots feel? And what is it about India that you think makes it a powerful nation and the future of the world? You know, I feel that history, culture and spirituality three strong strengths of India. Okay. History. You know, whatever we are, our genes, they can flow from our parents, from our generations, grandparents, etc. The genes of India are flowing from its history and our, our culture. It's a 5,000 plus years of history. You know, till 1700, that is the 18th century, we, between India and China, we had more than 50% of the GDP in the world. And 200 years, that means in 1850, 2050, you perhaps will have similar situation again. So the point I'm saying is that India was a great civilization, great country, till as recently as uh, it was among the top countries uh, till 200 years back. And we are soon going to be among the top countries again. So this is our strength. You know, I tell you, uh, lots of children, of course, go to America because of good education. But I'm happy the new education policy has come. And you're going to get good education in India. Everything else is better in India. You know, we may have uh, some pollution sometime because we are getting industrialized. But in many ways, we are better off. There is enough pollution the Western world has also faced. So my contention is these three strengths are history, culture and spirituality and our family bondings phenomenal. This is the value system which will make India great once again. And the whole world, you see how the Western world is looking at India for everything, whether it's food, whether it's yoga, whether it's culture, whether it's religion, they're all looking because the kind of peace that you get uh, in spirituality and religion can't get anywhere else. And I'm a military man and I'm talking of spirituality. See the power of spirituality and, uh, uh, you, you, you know, religion. So uh, we, we in armed forces uh, strongly believe we have, uh, you know, every station of ours has got a temple, Gurdwara, we've got a church, we've got a mosque. Because we feel that a soldier needs to connect, be spiritually connected. That's a big strength of us. Yes. That's so amazing. And I'm so happy that, that you're openly talking about that because I feel like, um, you know, there's very less people who like you and, you know, are actually coming out in the space and talking about that for the youth. It's so much needed in the time today. You know, a lot of youths are walking through this and, you know, because of this lack of bondage with themselves and the spiritual foundation, they can't even focus on their careers. They can't even pursue their passion in the right way, right? Because their heads are always lost. They're always diverted. Um, so that that's thank you so much for actually sharing that. Yeah. Um, you know, and coming back to you, um, 
you know, everyone has their own practices that they do, like, you know, to maintain, uh, like, for example, if you don't have any work or any engagements, you know, some people like to read during their pastimes or meditate or something like that. So what is it for you that keeps you engaged, like, you know, when you don't have work or you have some free time, what do you like to do in that time to maybe clear your head a bit? You know, there are three things which I have been doing for many, many years. And a large number of people whom I have met, I have uh, told them, so I will tell you those three things and thereafter I will also answer what do I do in my free time. Those three things are, first, every morning when you get up, make somebody's day. Give a positive stroke to somebody, whether you do it physically uh, in the house uh, or somebody you meet outside or you give a great WhatsApp message to somebody or to give an email to make somebody feel important and happy. A very strong thing to do. Second, give away something as a gift to somebody every day. I've been doing that for 18 years. It's not difficult. I will tell you, each one of us in our homes, in our lives, we got so much. We have something, even a poor man has got something to give away as a gift every day of his life. I do that every day. It, whatever, it may be very small, it may be big, just give. So there is this power of giving, which I believe is very powerful. The third, which is a little more difficult, but I do it, do something new every day. Even if it means uh, making a new flower pot, uh, redoing something in your house, to something new that will leave footprints on the sands of time for everybody to follow. You know, these three things uh, I have taught to many people, not taught, suggested to many people. I do that myself. But coming to yourself, as I said, you know, in the beginning, life is about passion. Uh, your core, uh, you know, area for me, aviation was a passion. But the day I retired, I can't fly anymore because I'm a retired man. My age is also crossed uh, when I can't fly anymore. So I must have another passion. So I found a new passion. Other than these few things like music, etc. I, at age of 60, I started writing and reading. And today I have got seven books and over 700 published articles from age 60 to 70 in 10 years. Amazing. That's one hell of a quantity, Incredible. you know. So the point I'm saying is, the day I retired, I said, what next? <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't fly, which I would love to. The last thing I want to mention in this is, you know, if you can tell at the end of your life that in my next life, I want to live the same life, that means you have actually lived your life. You see, uh, that means you chose a career which was good, you loved it, you enjoyed it, and you made the best of it. This is very important for the youth of the country. That at the end, you have to ask your own self, boy, what did I do? Did I waste my time? What did I, was I happy? Was I enjoying my life? Or just very, very important that you should be able to tell. And I can say it with pride that I want to be a fighter pilot in my next life if I ever were to come as a human being. Yes. Nice. Yeah. No, it's so, you know, because what you're talking about, doing something new every day or, or continuing your passion, you, as you probably know, suicide rates are rising to the top across the world because of depression, because of you know, the youth being so anxious about their careers, about their relationships, about their body image. Social media is a big part of that. Um, and I think just if you even implement what you said, just trying to find something new and not stopping your passion, what happens a lot of times is if the youth, you know, they fail in one career and it's happened with me too. You know, I've shifted careers and my choices a lot because of rejections and because someone's better or because for any other reason and then you tend to fall into depression then you have suicide thoughts and so on and so on so i think that's a really really powerful message to not be able to quit your passion um so that's that's beautiful and then going back to what you said about the gifts 
I just want to put this out on camera. I remember when I first met you a year back, you had given me, I don't know if you know, know if you remember, but you had given me a gift from your drawer. Um, it was coasters, black uh, coasters, and we still have them upstairs mm-hmm. in my room. Um, and I remember that gesture was like no other because no one does that. No one just randomly goes and gives you something. Um, and that's such a beautiful gesture because honestly, like the feeling of love and giving to someone, there's no other happiness. Um, you know, even for me, I've experienced like in US, you know, this gesture isn't really there. But in India, like, um, you know, even here I've tried with like my mom tells me, you know, if, for example, outside there's some workers, laborers who are doing work and they have small children. And sometimes she says to, you know, just make some popcorn and give it to them. And I've done it a few times and it honestly feels so good. Like it takes five minutes, but that feeling of happiness, you just don't get anywhere else. So I think that's so important for the youth. You know, I, let me, you know, Amira, tell you about two things that you mentioned in this little conversation. One is uh, suicide and second is social media. You know, suicide by any person is a failure of the entire ecosystem around him, the person. The friends, the parents, the teachers, everybody. It's a failure of the system. Why? If we are not allowing a child or youth to be able to freely communicate, Mm -hmm. then there is something now burning inside him or her, which could lead in some extreme cases to suicide. So therefore, we have to create a culture, an ecosystem, where the child has freedom to speak, freedom to tell, to the mother, the father, to, to friends, what is, what is not. That is the starting point for stopping suicide. Everything else, drugs, counseling, all later. Mm-hmm. First is have an ecosystem. Parents have to be like friends. I as a parent cannot let a child to say, Hamare zamane mein aisa hota tha. So isliye you expect the child to live my life, what I lived world is changing. I today am trying to live the life of my grandchildren. I told my daughters when they were growing up that I will not let myself get so left behind in technology that I can't converse with you. I have to move to that generation and not expect that generation to come to my generation. Only for values, I will give them the values. Everything else, I will come to their generation and they will go to the generation next. So first is for suicide. This is very, very important. Get your, you know, children to be like friends and free to you. Yeah, I can, I can vouch right. on that. Yes. Like from my own experience and my mother was like always a friend for yes. me. And that's really helped you because yes. you can share with her, you can just be open and then you have the right type of guidance you don't have to go to bad company and bad association so i think it's a good message. Yeah. so the second thing that you asked was about social media mm-hmm. you know everything every new technology has conveniences and adds what some negative sides but just because there is some small negative side i will not jettison the technology you know, in, from Telegram, we have come to WhatsApp. Over the years, you were in Telegram, then you came to phone, and then, and then you came to a pager, and then you, whatever. Today, you're on WhatsApp. Instant messaging. And the amount of data and information I can convey to each, we can convey to each other is phenomenal and instantly. So, plus, I can count on all technology, even Facebook. Okay, I can't speak to you for whatever reason, but I can see you. I can see your picture, you're making a holiday. Whatever. So there are pluses of every technology. But if I was to get addicted, well, I could have got addicted to drugs. I could have got addicted to 20 other bad things. So addiction is the issue. That's common for everything. Not just, you know, whether it's to alcohol, drug. So if the youth is... Uh, using technology for convenience, uh, for uh, speed, for, you know, doing things better and faster, educating themselves. The kind of videos I get to see on WhatsApp, some of them are extremely educating. But there are 99% of which I may just delete. Mm -hmm. 
I don't even look at uh, some of them. So uh, the social media has strengths, mm -hmm. it has its problems, but problems are galore for many other things. So not just for social media. Double sided story. Yeah, double sided story. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. So, you know, you're in a profession where you have to deal with a lot of negative circumstances and especially a lot of unconscious people. So, and that's really goes for all of us, you know, um, even the youth, like every day. And that's why association is so important. We meet people who are unconscious, who are, you know, negative, who have that influence on each other. So how do you deal with that, um, you know, in the best way possible? Because you have to make sure, like, especially with the career that you're in, you have to deal with enemies. How do you deal with those circumstances and people? In military, uh, bonhomie, camaraderie, these are very, very important things. You know, uh, you have to fight as a team. You know, for a fighter pilot, if that other pilot in the second aircraft is not clearing my tail for a possible enemy coming from behind, then I'm gone. Mm -hmm. So I could be the commanding officer and he could be the young officer. There is bonhomme, there is camaraderie, there is teamwork, which is very, very important. Now, this is important not only in armed forces. It is important in every organization. You know, for any organization, a business house, to succeed, teamwork. The principal cannot run a school or college alone. It has to be a teamwork. So for us, the teamwork is very, very important. And second thing that happens in military is we are in cantonments, we are in camps, we are in military stations, we are living together, we are getting up in the morning, doing a PT together, we are doing our training together, we are doing having meals together, we are having, we are spending the day, even having a drink in the bar in the evening together. So that kind of a thing is very, very important for organization. I am so happy to see that many in the corporate world are trying to organize special events, outings, picnics, uh, you know, uh, to get that kind of a culture within the corporates too, so that the people can interact socially in private lives also. So therefore, uh, this aspect is very, very, uh, you know, important. And when you bond and live together more closely, you can identify people uh, who are having uh, problems, who are laggards, who are, uh, you know, having some other complexities, who have got health problems, mental health problems, and it's so much easier. Uh, for the ecosystem. In our case, the wives also run a welfare association. We, we bond with the wives. We want to get everybody. We, we, we find out how the children are doing in their schools. So the more you will involve, I think uh, the problems you will be able to identify and find good solutions. Yes. That's, that's really good. That's great advice for everyone and yes. especially the youth who are growing up and yes. kind of facing this on a daily basis. Yes. Um, and, you know, I really want to talk to you about the value system. You know, you grew up, as you said, with values that were strong, rooted, um, you know, in the ND and your learning experience. I feel like what's happening in, as modernization is coming through, our value system, you know, I don't know, maybe sometimes even in India, I see youths, especially in the U.S., you know, the value system is degrading. And like an example of that is, um, you know, children, how they're treating parents, uh, you know, how you know, kids are, you know, youths are treating each other um, with disrespect, all these things, which, you know, at one time, especially in India, used to be so strong. You know, there used to be so much respect, so much love. That value system is, I feel like, going down. So what do you have to say about, you know, that? Because in your profession, as a fighter pilot, discipline, respect, you know, is very, very important. And even in a family with children, parents, that's kind of diminishing. So what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, you know, I agree with you, Amira, that uh, times are changing. But, you know, I'm an optimist. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe that uh, times can change, but the world has to go on. The, you know, families have to carry on. They have to live. Yes, there are more and more people. There are old times. They were joint families. Nowadays, everybody is living separated. Even uh, husbands and wives are lying in bed. They are both on WhatsApp with different people. And they're sort of not even communicating with each other. So first thing is about the value system. You know how your mother will treat her father-in-law or mother-in-law is what you will be treating your, you know, parents later on. So first, the elders have to continue to set example. Mm -hmm. 
but setting example has to change with times because uh, the technologies have come the way we communicate has changed i mean if i can give a whatsapp to my father and make him laugh in the morning well that's a way of my communicating because i'm sitting far away but i, I you know if i was to give a video call to my father in the morning i am or to my children i am using technology for bonding i can do a group call i can get the whole family on board on the whatsapp in a video call so my contention is the times are changing these are realities people are living in separate they're talking less they're doing more through social media this is this is a reality generations from here we we may be like robots ourselves you know we may behave also and think like robots so how the societies adjust to these realities uh, i have i know homes where when you come to the dining table the mobiles are not allowed mm-hmm. you know the mobiles up you do put them away so each family each group of people have to find ways of uh, handling this relationships i also feel that many of the you know people who are wanting to inspire others motivators inspirational leaders they make videos and they put on whatsapp which every time you see it just gives you a little reminder that no we have to uh, live our lives uh, in a slightly different way so i am getting many times inspired by a good video which i receives on a, receive on a whatsapp so but again your own value system i can enjoy and ins- get inspired from the video because i have a value system which is ingrained in me so that basic value system has to be handled for which we already spoken yes yeah, yeah. i think a good point is that if you know elders even if they set an example but you're in a bad you're in a bad company or you have bad friends so it's good to maybe stay away from those people and build a new set of community for yourself there was a, a, a parent who's uh, who was my colleague his uh, daughter had got into a bad company but he was very proud that my daughters were doing very well so i used to take his daughter and my daughters out for a lunch to get them to get inspired from each other you know so with the result what happens is uh, out of the box little little things we have to keep doing in life uh, to somebody in the group has to do that uh, so that uh, you know uh, people start interacting and maybe the the, the person who's going astray will get inspired change definitely and even if small percentage of people we can change so it's a big That's thing true. yeah yeah thank you so much yeah. thank you so much in my channel